Activism is an important first step to engage with our politicians and governments, and it can take many different forms, like small-scale individual advocacy or larger organization-led action. Tiny ripples can result in big waves, and we are stronger as one. We are small islands, separated by oceans. But when our voices are united, we can demand real change. My name is Andy Liebert and this is Islands on Alert, a podcast where we discuss how climate change has already affected our islands, what's in store for us if the earth continues to warm, and how we can help to reduce the devastating impacts. So today, to talk about youth activism in the small island developing states, we have Okalani Marina, who is a member of the Pacific Climate Warriors. Now, she spoke at the 30th anniversary of AOSIS, where she encouraged legislation, litigation, and education to create change. Okalani, thank you for speaking with us today, all the way from Samoa. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Andy. All right. Thank you so much for being a part of our podcast series. First of all, the the, the most famous person that I would know from the Samoa Islands would be Dwayne Johnson. (laughs) (laughs) Am I correct? (laughs) (laughs) Am I correct? And that would be The Rock. Yes. Am I correct? Yes, that is. All right, cool. And now I, I, I have met... Famous person number two. <laughs> oh, that, that's too high a title for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much for being a part of our, uh, part of our podcast series. Um, first and foremost, though, um, you're involved in climate action, and I'd like to get an idea from you what exactly inspired you to be a part of the movement. Thank you. Um, sure. So I've been in environmental circles for about four years now. Um, And I started my journey when I was 16 in high school. Uh, I was just a student going to my um, next science class when we found out we had a lecturer coming in. Um, And he was a speaker and he was really involved in environmentalism and waste recycling, specifically plastic. Um, And so he was doing a quick TED, TED talk on why plastic is bad and how in 2050 there would be more plastic in the ocean than fish Um, and it was really ironic when I was listening to that because I was holding a water bottle in my hand like a plastic water bottle and he was talking about all the bottle caps that are in there so I was like I feel very highly motivated (laughs) to stop and probably change my behaviors Um, And from there, I started doing more research because unfortunately, I had never learned about climate change before that in school. Um, And so when I was doing more research, I realized that um, a lot of behaviors in terms of diet affects the climate. And I decided at that moment that I would go vegetarian. Um, And so I went vegetarian for four years. I'm not anymore, but (laughs) I was (laughs) for a while. And I really participated in a lot of the sustainability trends that were going on, like real waste, zero waste, um, plastic free July. So I was um, involved a lot in that. And I also did a lot of beach cleanups and community cleanups. But um, until recently, I had realized um, as I was doing more research into climate action that for a Pacific Islander, Um, or just a person like me from a small island nation, going zero waste and um, being vegetarian wouldn't really make a difference because of how tiny of an effect we have um, to the plastic pollution and to a lot of the gas out greenhouse gas emissions and so I sort of changed my stance to really focus more into policy and driving action from a government level um, and so I started really being more vocal um, locally um, to government and I would be more involved in the local organizations that were a part so before 350 Pacific I was involved in a smaller one called Fina Final Pacific Um, And I was an environmental ambassador from here to American Samoa, which is our sister islands. 
Um, and so from there, I was noticed by Brianna Fruin. I don't know if you guys know of her, but she is an amazing environmentalist, and she was also a um, she was also a prize winner for the Commonwealth Award. Yeah. So she mm -hmm. so she received that, and she was actually my mentor for a lot of the um, policies and just understanding climate change more. Um, and so being under her wing it was like really inspiring. And I realized that um, driving change from a government level is really how we could get things moving um, as a Pacific Islander um, and not just local government, but regional. Um, and when we like agree on what things to push in conferences, that's really how we were gonna make a change. Um, so when I got to university, um, I realized that I was really passionate about getting into environmental policy, but yes. a lot of youth were not aware of environmental policy. And at that moment, I had acknowledged that I actually had a lot of privilege because I, I was able to get an education. I was able to be mentored by a lot of people. I was able to have access to a lot of resources that helped me understand climate change more. But a lot of the local youth didn't. Um, and that was something I realized and I felt very driven. And I felt very passionate because I feel like I have all of this information and I really want people to know it. That's my, like, I want more people my age to understand climate change and how to make a difference. But they, they just didn't have access to those resources. Um, so I was really fortunate because when I went to university, um, it's, it's called foundation, but it's kind of like the an intermediate right before university. So when we go out of high school, we go into this one year course where you get ready for university um, because Samoa school system is a little confusing if we look at it from the <laughs> Western <laughs> We're um, learning, we're learning. So go ahead ahead, <laughs> feel absolutely free. Uh, yeah, uh -huh. but so we went to foundation and it's just like a year to get ready before you go and head off to university. Yeah. Um, so in that year, there was COVID lockdown right. um, and there was, that was 2020. And so there were so many restrictions. We feel a lot of solidarity when we think about how around the world, everybody was graduating online. So we were kind of like the first in Samoa to have that happen. Um, but it also opened up so many doors because we got access to online accounts and people were more familiar with going virtually when we were doing classrooms. Mm -hmm. um, so from that, our university's Dean of Science realized that there was no environmental-based student body. So in my year, we were the first to found an environmental student body in our national university. Um, so I am currently the active president for that. But What's the name of it? Lanulau Ava. So okay. Lanulau Ava is a Samoan word, but it translates to, roughly translate to, um, the green, like the flora and the fauna, um, and our environment. Um, and the reason we chose that name was because we wanted to embody the fact that our youth are the next generation. We're also protecting the green. And so we're protecting our environment, but we are also a part of it. Um, it it's, it's, uh, I need to translate it better, but that's the best I could do right now. <laughs> I think we got a decent picture <laughs> of it. <laughs> but um, tell me, what does activism mean for you? And uh, you seem to be approaching it from two tiers, from two levels, because we speak about policy, that there's some advocacy there on your part and on, pa on, on the part of your peers. And then you also want to reach at the community level. Okay. Um, in for my personal journey alone, I yeah. sort of don't see it as activism. I I kind of see it more like um, fighting for my islands and fighting for the right to live. Um, because for Pacific Islanders and small island nations, environmentalism and and policy decisions around you know, sinking islands, sea level rise, temperature rise, it's not really a decision. Um, it's more of like a daily life choice or life situation that we have to go through. Um, so for me, I didn't realize climate change was like a big thing because I had always just assumed it was part of daily life. 
I assumed it just happened. We just have cyclones every every year. It's just a thing, you know. We we get that and we go with it. Um, but I didn't realize the frequency and intensity was due to climate change. And so for me, it's like, hey, a lot of your decisions and a lot of the things you guys are carrying out strongly affects us. So you should really like not do that because we're trying to live here. You know? <laughs> um, and so for me, it's more like raising more awareness. Um, so for activism, activism i i really believe that it's you should go with community um and so that means that before you go to other places to make big decisions you should also go with the consent of your village of your nation um and so that means always keeping them in the loop when you're making big decisions before you leave um and that's why i feel like it's very important that we engage with communities before we engage regionally or internationally or at a government level um, and I realized for like decisions, really, it's actually very useful for, here, for us here in Samoa um, because of our government system. Um, and so before you become a member of parliament, you actually have to become a high chief in your village or in your area. And in order to do that, that means you have to really engage with your community and you have to be active in your community before they will vote you in as their member of parliament. Um, and it so seems to me that you're on your way there. <laughs> so, so, oh God. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so, so you really have to be um, engaged, but also hold a title before you go into that, into government. And so right. for our system, you have members of parliament who are leaders at a government level, but you also have members of parliament that are leaders at a community level. Right. Um, and so that's why it's so important to engage with your community because on top of having their consent and having them aware, it's really great to have their support when you go and you make these decisions. But unfortunately, that doesn't happen as much when it comes to environmentalism. You, you have them involved in other forms of policy making or other laws, but you don't have them fighting or agreeing on that the fact that climate change is important. Yes, um, yes, and it's not that we don't know it's real. It's, it's more like they don't think it's a priority, mm -hmm. just okay. like other nations. Yeah. I, I'm going to quote this. I'm going to quote this. And it comes from some of the reading that I've been doing over the past couple of days, especially where your activism is concerned. Mm -hmm. We're not drowning. We are fighting. I'm sure wow. it rings with familiarity for you. And yes. <laughs> It struck me just a while ago as a result of the fact that you spoke about your environment, living with the ocean, and uh, the pending danger that you see and having to live with these strong weather systems, of course, all attributed to climate change. We're not drowning, we're fighting. What does that mean for you? For me, ooh. I can go off, <laughs> but I'll try to make this short. Um, for me, when I, whenever I say that, um, it's a reminder as to why I'm fighting. Um, because a lot of times when I'm talking to other people that are not from small island nations, uh, they, their reaction is not um, to engage, but it's to feel pity. Um, and I don't want people to pity us because we're from a small island nation and because our small islands are facing all of the effects full hand, I want them to make, uh, do action. I want them to be like, hey, just because we are a small island nation doesn't mean we are weak. It means that we are fighting to protect them. We are not here sitting and waiting for the next wave to come and take us. We're going to fight for our islands. And it means that we're not going to take your pity. We want to see your action we want to see you guys actually move because a lot of this was caused by you not us so it's it's kind of like a reminder to me to keep fighting um because sometimes when you are from a small island you can feel helpless because um of how small of a difference you make um and how small you can feel your voices um so for me it's a reminder not to be afraid whenever i'm um raising my voice um, but yeah, that's just for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, together we are stronger. 
Mm. Together we're strong. Um, there are many islands, and they've all come together under the banner of EOSIS, Alliance mm -hmm. of Small Island States. And as a result of your work, especially, let me say it's on the advocacy side of things, as opposed to activism. Um, we've come together now under this umbrella organization of EOSIS, and you're part of the celebration at the 30th anniversary. You've seen the work that EOSIS is doing. You've seen the work of the islands and every member territory in terms of uh, fighting for policy changes and so on. Um, talk about that story as to how you got involved and how do you feel to be a part of it? Um, involved in the... Oh, EOSIS, yeah. That, that's actually very funny. Um, mm -hmm. So when I was invited to speak, I was emailed that by my mentor, Brianna. And I remember the first feeling I felt was just imposter syndrome. I'm like, Bibi, there are like, how many other girls? Why are you asking me? <laughs> I was like, please, please, please. I might be, I might look like I'm good at public speaking, but I am like super like riddled with anxiety. I have like major stage fright. <laughs> um, You're not convincing me at all. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so when she when she approached me, she was like, hey, I really think this is a great opportunity for you right. to uh -huh. speak. And I really think you have you have something to say that would really be insightful for um, this specific celebration. And so I was just staring at um, the coordinator's email for a solid hour, just trying to figure out what my next steps were going to be. But I remember feeling a responsibility to raise my voice um, that I was not just doing it for myself but I was raising my voice for my people and my islands um, and that's what really drove me to actually take on this role that I was not representing myself but I was representing Samoa mm -hmm. so with that in mind um, I had to really go into like writing mode which is what i like to say because um at my core i'm i'm very much a storyteller and an artist so i really love um pushing my message through different art mediums and also through spoken word so um i wrote a poem recently uh, a couple of years ago for my grandfather before he passed away um and it was very grounding for me because it was the first time i had written a spoken word um, inspired by climate change um, and so before big events I usually just read that over myself um, to remind me of why I'm doing things before I speak um, Brianna told me that she well, she wanted me to speak because I had recently just been involved in a training for Pacific Climate Warriors and she said that um, from there that's how she chose me um, along with um, the elders in their council um, but yeah, that's how I ended up being involved, and there's no looking back, I guess. Yeah, absolutely not, and I would hate to believe that there's some turning back after this, because you are <laughs> thoroughly impressive. Um, I wanted to ask you as well, because you're a young person. You enter the room, and there are all these older folks, well-seasoned in negotiations and frameworking of policy and so on. As a youth advocate, being a part of this global conversation and is dominated by the voices and interests of the older generation, how do you raise your voice? How do you make it heard? And is that a sort of intimidating situation for you? And are you fueled by the cause and the purpose that you're advocating? I will not deny that that would be very intimidating. Especially yeah. if there are a ton of boomers in the room, I'm just going to be staring at them like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to use normal people English now because I'm a Gen Z, so you guys will not understand me if I start speaking the way I usually speak. <laughs> um, but first, I would probably just do breathing exercises, I'll be honest. <laughs> yeah. But um, when I deliver messages, I don't actually... Um, really speak i i use stories um and so if i was in a room with um older people i 
have nothing to give but my own lived experiences and the lived experiences of my people. So mm-hmm. I would definitely communicate to them in story form um, and just my experiences because I can't really talk about policy because, again, I'm only 18. Um, and for me, my, the responsibility of youth, um, in my personal opinion, is not to create policy, but to hold people accountable and hold people in power accountable for what they've done. And so our role as youth is to be like, hey, you shouldn't be doing this. And you said you'd be doing this, but you're doing all of these other things. And this is how it's affected me as a small island nation and our people as a small island nation. What are you going to do about it? But just before we go, um, from what I've seen of Samoa, it's a beautiful place. And I've read some things from you just recently, as a matter of fact. And I just want you, for the benefit of our audience, it might very well be a new audience that you're speaking to um, through this podcast. Would you be able to tell us, and I'm sure you will be able to, one aspect of your home, where you live, where you've spent most of your life, that you're afraid of losing as a result of climate change? One aspect of my culture that I'm very, very proud of is actually the culture itself and our traditions. Um, So I grew up in a very um, lively community and Samoa personally, if nobody knows, is located smacks like, smacks in right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So um, we're actually so small that we, Samoa itself has more ocean than land in terms of um, space that we have. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And so something that I really like about us is, fun fact, the word tattoo is from Polynesian language. Um, Mm -hmm. And so for us, we have um, markings um, and we also have stories. Um, And so because we are an orator-based um, small island nation, a lot of our history and a lot of our libraries are actually through storytelling and through elders. And so something I'm very proud of is that when you sit down with your grandmother or you sit down with the village elder, you are speaking to an entire library of knowledge. Um, and so that's something that I am so afraid of losing once climate change affects us. It's the stories, it's the rich knowledge that we carry. Um, it's our language, um, and it's also our tattooing tradition. Um, and so traditionally, when you're marked, you are um, only the village chiefs and the village chief's daughters can be marked, um, and they're called Taupo and High Chief. And so um, that's usually how it is, but others can be marked as well. And so it's really beautiful. It's from the knee all the way to your upper thigh, all around. Um, but yeah. You should, yeah, <laughs> that's something I'm afraid of losing if, if um, climate change really takes us. It's my culture um, and it's my language and our connection to the environment. Your stories have been totally moving and inspiring. Really, thank you so much for sharing that journey with us. I really appreciate it. And thank you so don't Debbie. ever give up. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I, I will, thank I will you. remind myself that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Eddie. We'll be right back after the break. To further our conversation on climate activism, I have the privilege of speaking with Michael Sheldrick. Uh, Michael is the current Global Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Global Poverty Project. Now, this is a project brought on by an organization called Global Citizens. Global Citizen is an international education and advocacy organization working to catalyze the movement to end extreme poverty. Hi, Mick. Thank you for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm going well, Andy, and it's a real pleasure to be on the show. Yeah. Well, as you know, I'm from the island of Antigua, and our citizens there have known about global citizens. 
especially through the television screens. We've been there um, with Global Citizens Live. Um, so we've known about uh, the entertainment part of it and of course the messaging that you've been trying to transmit as a result of the platform that has been made, that has been afforded to you. But tell us a little bit more about Global Citizens and its place, especially in climate action, which is the focus of Island Voices. Yeah, well, Global Citizen, we're a movement of over 10 million citizens around the world taking action to defend the planet and defeat poverty. And we were founded um, over a decade ago, as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm from the other side of the world, um, an island too, but perhaps uh, a much bigger island. A very big um, island. <laughs> of, of, of Australia. And, and look, we were... We were student activists at the time, and really what we felt about all of the major challenges of our time, be it extreme poverty, be it climate change, these were inherently systemic issues. And if you're talking about systemic change, you need a social movement in order to change that. And so at the heart of our organization is really this idea that the citizen is the major agent of change and action is our currency. So we don't just focus on raising awareness, educating, but the message is you actually have to get up and do something to contribute to our world because we've always seen whether leaders in businesses or leaders in government, they move according to public opinion. That's what they do. And so our job is to motivate millions of people to get out there, use their voice and hold our leaders to account. And you mentioned climate change. Well, our leaders have already agreed to avoid catastrophic climate change. You know, they all came together in the Paris Agreement six years ago, and they made promises, and they made promises to reduce their emissions, but they also made promises to help um, many countries, including small island states, including the most vulnerable, and those promises aren't being kept. And so through our platform, we're encouraging our governments to hold and keep true to the promises they made to avoid catastrophic climate change. Because from our perspective, you know, it's the most vulnerable that's gonna be hit the hardest and fastest um, by climate change. And so, you know, for many countries, this indeed is existential. And so that's, that's really, you know, um, at the core of what we do, we see climate change and poverty as, as almost two sides of, of the same coin. Are they related? Poverty and climate change? How do they impact each other? You know, um, just before the pandemic, I was um, yeah. in Sierra Leone with, um, with Idris um, and Sabrina Alba. It was actually Idris's first trip to Sierra Leone. That's his, mm -hmm. that's his heritage. And yes. I remember we met with some farmers um, mm -hmm. and they told us about the fact that because of unpredictable rainfall patterns and as a result of extreme weather events you know in part caused by climate change you know yeah. they had seen severe reductions in their crop yields and so this was having an impact on livelihoods it meant they weren't being able to turn surpluses you know in terms of income but it was also having an impact on hunger levels as well because if it's impact in our food systems it means we can't get out food to those who need it so you know climate change absolutely is having an impact on on the most poor and you look at you know not just mitigation you know in the fact that you know at the moment most of the climate change has been caused by emissions from the advanced industrialized um, country over the last countries over the last two centuries or so whereas you take the entire continent of africa which contributes less than four um, percent of, of emissions around the globe so it's not just about mitigation, but you look at adaptation and resilience, well, many of these communities, such as those farmers in Sierra Leone, are on the front lines against uh, climate change. And of course, I don't need to tell you about the impact this is having on islands, whether it's in the Caribbean or closer to, to my home in Australia, the Pacific, you know, Pacific, this yes. is, mm -hmm. yeah, this is, this is literally um, multiplying many of these issues and you lay it on top of what we're seeing with the pandemic, you know, my, my message to people has been, yes, we need to address the pandemic, but frankly, we can't wait until the pandemic is over because if we don't start taking action now, we're gonna miss the window to avoid catastrophic climate change. And yes, it's the poor who are on the front lines of that. 
Absolutely. And, and one thing I would say is, look, in the, billion, in, in, in the pandemic, we saw that billionaires were able to take refuge. They were able to go to their fancy villas. They were able to fly around. You know, we, we saw the inequities on display. But with climate change, you, you can't escape that. Maybe billionaires can fly off to a different planet, but ultimately there is no escaping the, the disaster that can come from climate change. So it's in all of our interests to stand in solidarity with one another. I think it was the, the foreign minister of Nigeria when we launched Global Citizen Live, he said, we have to be our brothers and our sisters keepers, both for us and the next generations. And he said, frankly, space can wait. We've got <laughs> enough issues we need, to, we need to solve here. Yeah. Indeed. Uh, on your website, there are two core principles, two core issues under the heading of uh, defeat pro poverty, defend the climate. So acknowledging that climate change and poverty are somewhat inextricably linked, as you quite um, so eloquently explain. They're two sides of the same coin, pretty much. What does taking climate action look like for global citizens? How does it look, all I, work? How does it all come together? Yeah, look, I think it's twofold. On yeah. the one hand, you know, it's about encouraging businesses to step up. You know, mm -hmm. about a, a hundred, a hundred and sixty companies or more, and you can go to this website, um, Climate Action One Hundred Plus. But it's about a hundred sixty companies, which is responsible for eighty percent of global industrial emissions. And so one of the things we've been encouraging throughout this year is for businesses to really step up and set targets in line with the Paris Agreement. What does that mean? It means setting science-based targets in terms of your emissions. It means pledging to reduce emissions by most likely at least 50% by the year 2030. And it means making sure that you're doing everything in your power in line with avoiding a greater than 1.5 degree temperature rise. And, and the importance of, with that, as I say, science-based target, what does that mean? Well, we've seen a lot over the last two years of people starting to say, we're going net zero or we're now carbon neutral. The challenge is, is you, can, you can claim you're carbon neutral and you can just be offsetting all of your emissions, right? but you're not actually reducing any of your absolute emissions. And so to say you're um, science-based means that you, had, you have done everything in your power to reduce your emissions um, and only then do you use offsetting as a last resort, but, very, but, at, at its, but, but you can't offset your way out of this. You actually have to make the hard decisions. And so, you know, I would just caution anyone who sees labels like, carbon neutrality, net zero, mm -hmm. dive deeper. What are they committed to? Have they committed to reduce their emissions by at least 50% by 2030? And what we've seen is amongst the Fortune 500, at least at the start of the year, you know, only a quarter had set any type of science-based target commitment to use 100% renewable, you know, in, in terms of power in their operations and businesses. And so we've been encouraging businesses to set aggressive, science-based targets that's one the second thing is right. is we also know it's not just about reducing emissions we also need to take carbon from the atmosphere right and i think it was john kerry president biden's special envoy on climate change that said you know for example we we need to be planting trees five times faster than we currently are and so we've been encouraging businesses governments and others to invest in nature-based solutions to really accelerate what we're doing to plant trees. Because yes, uh, a miraculous technology might come along that can at scale suck carbon out of the atmosphere, but that's one heck of a bet. So let's also invest in nature because we need nature to also protect us. How do you influence our leaders to take action? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good question. I, mm. I, th I think you can d divide leaders into two buckets. There's yeah. those leaders that want to do the right thing, but they need public support. And by this, I mean, um, as an example, a decade ago, I, I remember meeting with Julia Gillard, the first um, female right. prime minister of mm -hmm. Australia. 
and asking her at the time we were campaigning around polio eradication and would she elevate that on the agenda of a summit she was hosting. And I still remember she said, I'm very interested in this idea, but I need, I need some public support so I can convince the rest of my cabinet colleagues to make this a priority. And, um, you know, we, we always say at the end of the day, we can't always blame the politicians because we have to give them permission to spend, at least in that case, what is in the end our money, right? And so sometimes it's about a leader who wants to do the right thing. It's giving them ammunition and public support so that they can convince the rest of their colleagues to elevate this and prioritize it and put it to the top of the agenda. Um, you the say second, that you're onto something big here then. Well, 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 I think when you look at when you look at some leaders, right? Yeah. Um, you know, you look at um, President Biden, right? And you look mm. at his, his attempts to, you know, pass trillions of new dollars in revitalizing mm. infrastructure in America. And a lot of that infrastructure packages includes funding for climate change initiatives that includes funding for nature based solutions. There, you're basically saying, okay, for those senators that might be on the cusp of wavering whether or not to support this package. You know, they may want to, but they may be worried about their prospects at the next election. So you need to, you need to show them that there's a constituency here that cares about this issue that they can use as ammunition. It's, it's in effect giving them cover, right? But there is another bucket of leaders who frankly, yes. you know, don't want to do the right thing. And in that case, you know, our platform isn't so much a carrot as it is a, a, a stick. And in that case, it's about public shaming and it's about holding them to account. I mean, you know, I look at the UK and I look at um, the Boris government, the Boris Johnson government, and this year they've cut aid horrendously, you know, horrendously. And this was a government which said that they were going to revitalize the so-called global Britain. And now they're hosting COP26. And in the process, they've cut their aid to the poorest people in, in the world. And in that case, it's incumbent on us around the world to hold them to account for that broken, for that broken promise. So I think, you know, you can, you can, you know, divide our leaders into two categories. And I think for us, it's about if, if a leader wants to step up and do the right thing, we need to encourage, we need to give credit where credit's um, due. We also need to push them more because there's always more to do. And then mm -hmm. we need to hold those others to, to account as well. And, and at least make them feel, feel the pressure um, and know that there's a constituency out there that don't agree with their actions. In those two aspects, it seems like if you are revolutionizing change by doing things from the ground up in terms of the ordinary citizen, getting them to change their mindsets, if, 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 I, can, if I can say it that way. And then in the other aspect, for those who are not so willing to change, this is where the whole aspect of activism comes in, huh? Yeah, right? yeah, it is. And it's and it's mm -hmm. reminding them that actually, you know what, um, and, and we see this in the pandemic at the moment, we see right. this with, you know, the huge levels of vaccine hoarding we saw throughout this year, right. And, you know, now we see the world talking about booster shots. And again, the science may reveal that booster shots is a necessity. But in the meantime, you know, we've got health workers, we've got the most vulnerable in parts of the world that haven't even been been vaccinated and it's about you know sending the message to leaders and and their constituents that actually no one is safe until everyone's safe we're going to keep seeing these variants pop up so we need to prioritize this so sometimes it is about marshalling the power of public opinion educating citizens on these principles and then getting them to 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 use their voice to send those principles back to their members of congress you know back to back to their um you know, elected officials. You know, I got an email this morning from my uncle who lives in the UK, mm -hmm. who um, some months ago, he, he said, you know, we always go back and forth whether or not he's gonna, he's gonna support our advocacy. Um, and he said, you know what, Michael, on this issue of vaccine equity globally, you've convinced me. I've written a letter to my local member of parliament saying, you know, we need to share more doses with the rest of the world. And he got a response back. And, you know, in that case, it's powerful because my uncle is a member of the local conservative party constituency in the UK. You know, he's probably not someone 
traditionally that would speak out on our global issues, but in this case he is, and so as Member of Parliament will pay attention to that and hopefully in turn advocate to, to the government. You know, you know, you know, Mick, um, as a result of the, this podcast, we've reached out to several island states across the world. As far as, well, the, the Pacific, and we've spoken to one youth activist that immediately comes to mind, Okalani Marina, and she's from Samoa. Now, in comparison to what you've been doing, because you pretty much have received global attention from your work and from your efforts, her work is pretty much localized. Um, sort of under the radar, but very impactful because she's very close to the community. But pretty much both of you are very concerned about the same things, which is very interesting and rolls apart. So how does her work compare with what you're doing, which is on a larger global scale? And how can you probably help? Look, ultimately, the the way I see our work at Global Citizen is, is a platform for, for activists around the world. Like uh, I often say, mm-hmm. I often say, you know, we, we should be holding up now that we've got this platform with millions of people taking action, we should be pointing up, amplifying and holding up these activists as, you know, really many of them have the solutions needed to address these issues. And so, you know, my message to anyone um, looking to share their story and galvanize support is to get in touch because we would love to we would love to share that um, you know on our content on our social media we have thousands of people who read and, and digest that at any one time in the lead up to our events it's hundreds of thousands if if not millions but really our role is to be holding up the next generation of of activists um, and pointing our leaders to follow their, their advice. Because interestingly, because as you mentioned earlier, that's how you got started, pretty much as a youth, huh? <laughs> it is. And, and look, I still remember some of those meetings <laughs> when, you know, we, we had never produced any large events. I still remember, you know, when we did our first concert in Australia in 2011, I was speaking to a potential producer who could help us and mm-hmm. they were asking me about my event experience. And look, if I was candid at the time, the only event I had done, we call it in Australia, a sausage sizzle, like a, a like a barbecue, <laughs> I guess. And that was for 50 people of this club. I was president of that uni and it didn't <laughs> go particularly well. Wow. Um, a bunch of people came, saw the disorganization, saw frozen sausages on the barbie and quickly left. <laughs> you know, so, so I remember people oh, looking at me and, and I remember <laughs> saying to someone, is it because we're young, you know, and they didn't say, they didn't admit to that, but I suspect that was part of it. Um, and I do remember though, I was grateful. There were a couple of people. One of them was a was an incredible woman. She was actually from Utah, uh, Lindsay Hadley, who had married um, a, a guy from Queensland, Australia, and moved back to Australia with her kids. And she had a phenomenal success in organizing concerts for charity here in the States. And she just happened to reach out. Um, she said, I heard you guys were doing this. And she had no idea that we were this small um, outfit at the time. And when her and I was talking, she said, wait, you mean to tell me your staff is your volunteers and some of them are your students from university? And I was like, well, yeah. But then she came back because I remember she was like, your energy of this organization is infectious. And she said, do you really think if we call this off, we do this concert that the prime minister might actually respond and make this commitment? And I mm-hmm. said, yeah, I mean, I think, I think she might. And, you know, it was that power of the idea and the clarity of purpose which rallied people to support us. And we had no, no money, no funds, no talent locked in, um, but they got behind. And so my advice to young activists is, if you can really pin down that clarity of purpose, right, then that, that can be really powerful um, and people will, will rally behind and, and wanna support that, yeah. And the important thing is um, when we've spoken to those residents, citizens of uh, those islands, many of their people, indigenous people, the local knowledge that they provide of changes to the environment is absolutely profound because it actually shows exactly how climate change 
is affecting their world. Um, do you try to involve them in your messaging, in your outreach, in your work in general? We, we, we do. I mean, I think mm -hmm. all, all organizations can, can yeah. do better at incorporating those voices. But for mm -hmm. us, and, and as we look at Global Citizen Live, for instance, in the yes. lead up, it was very important to us that we were holding up our partners, celebrating their efforts, um, big and small, um, and really, really put in a spotlight on, on their work. Um, but of course, you know, in order to do that, and, and you, you were saying earlier, we need to be able to identify and work with, with many of these activists. And sometimes that's hard. I mean, pre-pandemic, travel is already hard. It's much easier for someone to travel from Europe to America than an African country sometimes to, to, to America. Like the visa restrictions are hard, issues like that. You know, many of these young activists already have so many systemic barriers already, um, leveled against them just to be at the same table as activists from Europe, for instance. Um, and I suspect in a, um, you know, um, post pandemic where some countries have more vaccines than others, and you're already seeing it where you can only enter certain countries if you're fully vaxxed, you know, that, that makes it more harder to have a seat at the table. But ultimately, you know, if we think uh, more broadly about a lot of the institutions that responded to the pandemic, a lot of the institutions that finance development. I mean, there is, there is a sense, I think, that they largely failed to, to address the issue of inequity that we all foresaw 12, 18 months ago in terms of vaccine access. And I think, you know, we need a better way of responding to these crises, let alone climate change. And I think the only way to do that is to incur is is to have a situation where the people impacted most have a seat at the table, because this whole issue of vaccine hoarding, that was not unforeseen. I remember over a year ago saying this is something we had to safeguard against vaccine nationalism. You know, you had Covax, and the same people that was meant to make it a success undercut that with their pharmaceutical agreements. And so I do think we have to have a look at the governance and systems and architecture in our planet and say, okay, well, maybe it's time we give everyone a seat at the table. And so I think um, from our perspective at Global Citizen, you know, it's not just incumbent upon us to do that, but it's also calling for, you know, all of these big institutions to do the same. Um, Mick, when we think about climate change, yes, the one thing, the one thing that, that really touches you in a very nervous way, that you fear of losing? I think I, um, I grew up in, in Australia and yes. in Western Australia, it's, um, it's, it's one of the driest places um, on, on the planet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, for me, I, I haven't been able to go home in, in two years because of the pandemic and you know, it's very difficult with the travel restrictions, but, yes. you know, it's made me realize just being away how, um, how much I, I loved where I grew up. And Sydney is having it rough right now, I understand. Yeah, that very rough. Mm, and, yeah. and, and, you know, I, I think for me, you know, it's really made me homesick, but also appreciate, um, you know, Australia even more. It's a, it's a beautiful country. But when you look at the predictions, you know, through extreme weather events, through droughts, you know, it's it's scary. There's parts of Australia that wouldn't be livable. And I think it's already a very dry continent. You know, some parts of Australia and some towns, you know, could literally be, be ghost towns. And, you know, you, you then toss in, you know, other forms of extreme weather events, but it's, it's scary to think in, in several generations time, what our, what our kids might go through um, if, if we don't respond to this now. And, and some of the people, and this isn't even in several generations time, you know, they're, they're already born who, who, who may experience. And, and the thing that comes to mind is just, if that happens, it would be a tragedy because we know 
we know what to do here, right? It's like when you have a look at the pandemic, right? I, I tell this story about a few years before the pandemic happened, Dr. Ted Ross come into our event in September uh, 2017 festival. And I remember he was addressing some spectators and I had to find this box he could stand on and look out to the crowd. <laughs> and, he said, and he said, we are 10 minutes to midnight um, to a, a dangerous pandemic. We need to invest mm. now and we need to prepare to, worsen, to, to lessen the impact. None of those leaders responded. We knew this would happen. Yeah. We knew we were on course. Last year, when we said we need to invest now in an equitable system to distribute the vaccine, we knew if we didn't do that, we would end up in this lopsided situation where the rich nations get the vaccine and the poor don't have anything for years to come. We knew that. And with climate change, we know what's going to happen, right? And yet, through a tragedy of the commons on all of these issues, we failed. And the reality is, if we had started, this is what Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England, um, said in his new book, Values, and it's something I've written down. But if we had started the energy revolution in, in, the, 2000, in the year 2000, we could have kept within a 1.5 degree temperature rise by halving emissions every 30 years. Now we're starting, you know, now we know the issue is, is real. We, we must halve it every 10 years, right? And if we wait another four years to begin, we will have to halve emissions every year. And if we wait eight years to begin, it will be too late. And even if we stopped producing non-electric cars, commissioning new coal-fired power plants, you know, all of that right now, we will still continue to produce enough carbon based on current activity to hit a greater than 1.5 degree temperature rise. So we must begin now, like we, we can't wait. And the reality is, is the world of nation states doesn't work to respond to these big questions of our time, existential questions. And this is where the power of the citizen and the power of action is, is key. Um, we've got to be the ones to hold our leaders, businesses to account, and we've got to be the one to bring solutions because nothing I saw through the pandemic tells me that if we leave to our politicians alone, that we're going to address these issues. That, to me, that our response to the pandemic is the canary in the coal mine when it comes to addressing climate change. Nick, I'm very happy that you are a citizen of our globe. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, a real privilege and the content is a real fortunate experience and I'm able to speak to you. Thank you so much. Thank, thanks for having me on your show. I'm your host for Islands on Alert, Andy Liburn. Islands on Alert is produced by Lele Henry and Louis Price, owned of the Alliance of Small Island States media team. Special thanks to Tashwa James and Bianca Bedou for additional scripting. Join us next time.